everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I think we'll get started in the interest of time. So my name is Heather Lewis. I'm the manager of the International Department at Sioux College. Thank you all for joining us today. And special thanks to Elizabeth Long and Zia Sumar, who will be leading this information session for all of you. We often get questions from employers, um, and it's nice to be able to have a proper information session targeted specifically to employers. Um, so this is an opportunity for you to listen to the presentation and hopefully ask any questions you might have as well. So I'll pass it over to you, Elizabeth and Zia. Thanks so much, Heather. Great to be here, guys. Um, so how we're going to do it is uh, we'll go through our slides first um, to um, go through the topics. But if you have any questions, um, please enter them in the Q&A uh, buttons here. And uh, Zia and I will have a Q&A session at the end to try to answer your questions. All right, perfect. So of course, the first question is when can students work? Now, international students who are here on a study permit, that study permit actually does allow uh, them to work in Canada off campus. Um, it is restricted though to full-time students. So it is important to note that this ability to work without a work permit using only their study permit is restricted to students that are uh, full-time. The rule is that full-time students, the general rule is that full-time students can work off campus up to 20 hours a week during their regular semester and full-time, so without any cap on their hours during any regularly scheduled break. Now, with that being said, Currently, IRCC does have a temporary policy in place that allows study permit hold certain study permit holders uh, to work full time even during the semester. Now, this policy is restricted to those who um, had applied for or who held their current study permits um, on or before October 7th of last year, so October 7th, 2022. So this policy right now allows these particular students to work full time even during the school year um, and it's in place up until the end of this year so up until December 31st um, of 2023. For um, if a student is on any sort of authorized leave so if they have taken time off from their uh, studies during that authorized leave, they're not able to work at all using their study permit. If they have a separate work permit, then that's uh, completely fine. But using their study permit, um, if they're on any sort of authorized leave, they would not be able to work using their study permit. Lastly, international students may also have a co-op work permit, um, which is separate from their study permit. That co-op work permit is specific to semesters where they are um, actually doing a co-op program, um, and it does allow them to work full-time for that co-op uh, position that they're working in. But this is only limited to students who need to have a co-op uh, completed for, the, for their program of study. Okay, so when we're talking about students, these are the rules that apply while they are studying. Now, this ability to work on a study permit, the rules that we've just talked about right now, um, like I said when we started, it does only apply to full-time students. So as soon as an international student has completed their program, and that means as soon as they've received any written confirmation from the school that they've met the requirements for their program of study, they do have to stop working immediately until they apply for their uh, for a work permit. So as soon as, you know, we can't stress enough, as soon as they've received any confirmation from their school, that does mean that they do have to uh, immediately stop working. From there, once they're applying, once they've submitted their work permit application, um, they can start working full time while they're waiting for a decision on that work permit application. Now, this is for students who um, have applied for their work permit within that night within a 90 day period of completing their program of study and on the day of submission for their work permit application, um, they actually do did hold a valid study permit. So uh, a study permit that had not yet expired 
um, as long as they've they have that study permit, they're applying within the 90 days, they can start working full time while they're waiting for for a decision on the work permit application. So Zia, let's run some through some real life scenarios. Um, let's say I have a student and they're working with us on a co-op work permit. It's part of their internship. Um, and so they have a co-op work permit. Can they work full-time with us? Yeah, because it's part of their co-op, they have the co-op work permit. Yes, they can be working full-time. Okay, what if they didn't have a co-op work permit? Uh, they just had their study permit, but they were still attending classes as students. Can they work full-time for us? So it depends on when that study permit was issued, right? Right. Okay. If we're talking about the regular rules, then it would be that they're limited up to 20 hours a week, right, because this is off campus work. However, if their study permit was, um, if they had that study permit valid before October 7th, and it's still that same study permit that they're using, then yes, right now, because of that temporary policy, they can be working full time. Okay. Now, what if um, they completed their studies, they got the notice that they completed their studies. Um, can they work for us? No. So at that point, as soon as they've received their notice, they do have to stop working. What if their co-op work permit hasn't expired yet? Because they've completed their program, um, that co-op work permit is no longer applied, right? Because it's not, the work that they're doing is not part of their co-op. It's not part of their program requirements in order to complete their program of study. So that co-op work permit doesn't actually apply anymore. So the co-op work permit is only for when someone is doing a co-op program. It's not for any kind of work, right? That's correct. It's specific for that co-op program. It's specific for that position that they're using to meet their co-op requirement for their program. And then if they've applied for the post-grad work permit, let's say they just got their notice, they applied, their study permit hasn't expired, they're applying well within the 90 days, uh, can they start working? Yes, and they can start working full-time. Okay. And even if they don't have the work permit in their hand, they can still start working. That's correct. Yeah. So while they're waiting for a decision on that work permit application, they can be working full time. Wonderful. Okay. All right. So um, those are the rules with regard to working. But what do you guys need to see in order to make sure that they um, fall within those rules? Um, let's just talk first about the work permit. Now, if someone provides you with that open work permit, as long as it doesn't say, um, you know, for a co-op work permit, it, it will usually have a line, you know, authorized to work um, in work that is integral to the program. So that, you know, it's a co-op work permit. That's only for work that is integral to the program. Um, you review those conditions on the work permit very carefully. When someone has an open work permit, a post-graduation -gradu work permit, there shouldn't be limits on, you know, there shouldn't be any employers listed on the work permit. Um, there shouldn't be, most restrictions are, are, are not there, you know, no location restrictions, uh, no occupation restrictions, et cetera. Um, sometimes yeah. though, you will see a restriction where they are not authorized to work in healthcare or with children. Um, IRCC puts that in for people who have not done their medicals. So if you see that and you do want them to work in healthcare or with children, um, then uh, you, know, you should tell them, go and do your medicals and then get a work permit where that line is taken off, okay? Then what if you don't have a work permit yet? Then how do you know whether or not, you know, they can actually work for you legally? Um, so basically there is uh, something called implied status in Canada, implied status or maintained status. The rule is if you have made an application in Canada to extend your study permit or your work permit, before it expires, then you can work according to whatever the original document had stated until a decision is made on your new application, uh, on your new document. 
So let's say um, I have a, a student that whose study permit was expiring. And let's say they expired on April 30th. And they're going to continue to be a student. Um, they're still a full-time student. And they filed it, let's say, on April 29th. This IRCC website recommends that someone files it 30 days before, but that's just the recommendation. It's not the law. As long as they have made that application before it expired, they're fine to continue on um, with the previous status. Okay. We also have a special situation for international students when they finish their studies. Um, if they file the post-graduation work permit while they still hold a study permit and within that 90 days that Zia was talking about, they can start working full-time while waiting for that work permit. Now, what do you want to see then? Um, the best thing to see is a screenshot because everything right now is um, mostly filed online. So th if they filed online, they should show you a screenshot of their profile which on there will show that an, when an application was made and also if a decision has been made or not. Right now, the processing times for uh, work permits take around five to six months. So don't be surprised if you know after a couple of months, you ask them, do you have a work permit? They say, no, that's still okay. They can just show you a screenshot you know, of that date showing that it's still in process and that's you know enough evidence for you to have done your due diligence to make sure that they're still on implied status, okay? Now, IRCC has been issuing these letters um, that, I, it, you know, they're trying to be helpful, but sometimes it creates more harm than help uh, because these letters have wrong information on there. On these letters, often they will say, um, oh, um, you know, this person has filed a work permit extension and they have maintained that they, they're authorized to work uh, for the next three months or until a decision is made, whichever comes earlier. Well, the reason why they originally issued these letters is because work permit applications were usually taking less than three months. Okay. And so the original writers of these uh, letters just put this three months on not really paying attention as to whether or not they are, these letters really conform to what the law actually is. You know, and it's been a lot of issues right now because work permits take five to six months and a lot of employers read these letters and think, oh no, you know what? They can't work after that three month date is gone. But that actually is wrong. Um, according to the regulations, a person is able to work not just three months after they filed the application, um, they can work until a decision is made. So even if someone's uh, work permit is still outstanding after three months, that end date, don't pay attention to that end date. As long as the application is still outstanding, there still hasn't been a decision made, they filed the application before their current document, their work permit or study permit expired, they can still continue to work, okay? So many of the international students- Oh, Zia, I think you're on mute. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, now, now I can hear you, yeah. Perfect. Can't have a webinar without that, right? Um, so many international students, when they're done their program of study, they'll get a post-grad work permit. Right. Depending on the length of their program of study, um, the you know, that'll affect the length of the, the postgrad work permit. Normally, international students can only get one postgrad work permit in their lifetime. Right. So it was a very uh, special program that that really gave international students the a once in a lifetime opportunity to work um, anywhere in Canada. Now, over COVID, we've seen a couple of temporary policies being implemented by IRCC. The most recent one that was just announced um, is going to allow for a further extension of that postgrad work permit for 2023. So students whose postgrad work permits, who had a postgrad work permit that expired or are expiring in um, 2022, 2023, they will be eligible to apply for an 18-month 
open work permit, and that program will be beginning on April 6th. So, you know, for, for anyone who has uh, employees that are on that post-grad work permit um, and that expiry date is coming up, starting April 6th, they will actually be able to, to submit extension applications to get a further 18-month open work permit, which is, which is great. Now, aside from that, there are other work permits that international students may also be applying for. And so this is really so that you're more familiar with the different types of work permits that, that are out there. The first is the bridging open work permit. This is for individuals who have submitted a permanent residence application and that PR application remains in processing. Um, and so where they have that PR application, they don't have a decision on it um, and their work permits are nearing their expiry dates, they can actually apply for a bridging open work permit. So this is to allow them to continue working in Canada while they wait for a decision on that uh, permanent residence application. The second one are work permits for provincial nominations. So some of your employees may come to you and we'll talk about the, the PR process and the provincial nomination process in a, in a couple minutes, um, but you may have employees that, that are applying for permanent residence using one of the provincial nomination programs. Now, the routes that have in it, that require the support of an employer, so the employer job offer streams, which again, we'll talk about in a moment, um, there is a particular work permit that's associated with that PR application. This is different from the open bridging work permit uh, because the provincial nomination work permits are specific to the employer. So that means that they would get a work permit that only allows them to work for the particular company, the particular employer that supported them through the permanent residence process. The third one we wanna go over is a francophone work permit. So this is for individuals who are fluent in uh, French, now, as long as they have a high-skilled job offer here in Canada, outside of Quebec, they are able to get this francophone work permit. The job that they're working in does not need to be in French at all or have any sort of French component to it. Um, basically, what we have to be able, to, what they have to be able to demonstrate is that they um, are proficient in the language, regardless of whether or not they're using it for their job. With the Francophone work permit, again, this is a closed work permit, just like the provincial nomination one, which means that they it is tied to a particular position and would only allow them to work for the employer that supported that work permit application. Uh, so yeah, just um, wanting to talk about these um, closed work permits. For the PNP work permits and the Francophone work permits, what would the employer need to do? Yeah, so for any of these closed work permits and, and the free trade one, which is the next one as well, um, with these closed work permits, the employer will have to submit what's called an offer of employment. So this is an online form that's submitted through the IRCC employer portal. Um, basically, it outlines the conditions of employment. So things like, you know, what's the salary that you're going to be offering, any benefits, um, what are the job duties? These are all submitted through the employer portal to IRCC. Um, and the employer is also required to pay a $230 compliance fee. So this is basically um, the offer of employment and the compliance fee are the two things that the employer has to submit um, in order to support that work permit application. But again, the benefit is that the work permits are um, closed work permits, which means that they can only work for the particular employer that's listed on, on the permit itself and only in the position that was outlined in the application. And just to make it clear, uh, submitting this form um, is not in and of itself an application. What it is, is just registering what the job is going to be um, that's based on the work permit application that the applicant themselves, like your employees would apply for the work permit. Um, why the government, the government used to, back in the day, never require any registrations of jobs. And then um, they were worried about how uh, employers sometimes might abuse the program where they claimed that they were going to offer someone a certain salary and then in the end they never did. So what these offers of employment are is that you register, you know, details like how much you're going to pay someone, uh, how many hours they're going to work, where are they going to work, 
what are they going to do? And then um, after, uh, you know, after a while, there is a possibility that the IRCC might follow up and see afterwards, did you actually pay this person this amount? Did you actually, um, you know, provide them with these conditions? Um, so it's important when you file the offer of employment that you keep records showing and you must know what details you filed as well because you you have to adhere to those details but over and overall you know filing this offer of employment should only take a few minutes we usually do do it for the employer after you guys have reviewed everything um, but it's not it, it's not that much work per se um, in the very beginning it's just that you need to know what it is that you're filing make sure that whatever you're you say that you're going to do you're going to do and if you need to make any changes then you may want to talk with your immigration lawyer and make sure that those changes are uh, you know filed with the government afterwards yeah definitely that's very important um yeah, like you said, these are the conditions then that form the actual uh, employment relationship, which is great, uh, a great point, Liz. Um, the other work permit that is, again, that falls under these employer-specific um, work permits is the, the free trade work permits. So basically, Canada has agreements with certain countries and in those in those free trade agreements, it does include provisions um, that allow for uh, citizens of these particular countries to actually get work permits in Canada. Um, there's quite a few of them now. Uh, countries include things like, like the United States, Mexico, Colombia, Chile. Um, there's you know we have quite a few of the the free trade agreements now, and in them we do have provisions. Uh, for work permits. So that's another great route um, for applicants to apply for, for work permits in Canada. Now, if none of these, if none of these work permits um, apply to the employee that you're looking at, um, the other route is to go through a labor market impact assessment. Now, there's different streams when we talk about the LMIAs, but one of the uh, one of the great ones that we have right now is the Global Talent Stream. Uh, the Global Talent Stream is really geared towards tech-based companies and tech-based roles, but it does allow for quite a fast process in terms of um, getting that labor market impact assessment and then using it to apply for the, uh, so the employee can then apply for the work permit. With the LMIA, it's a bit more involved in terms of the employer side because you do have to, if you're going through the Global Talent Stream, um, set out a labor market benefit plan. However, with clients, what we tend to do is sit down and actually go through what the company is doing anyways as part of their regular HR strategy. Um, and that can generally form the majority of the benefit plan itself. So, you know, commitments in the benefit plan can th include things like hiring a certain number of employees or having a training budget, which generally through conversations with employers tend to be part of their regular uh, strategy and growth strategy anyways. So it doesn't have to be anything over and above what you're already doing. We can generally look and, and you can generally use things that you are um, already doing uh, with the company. So Zia, um, just going through the regular route for LMIAs, hmm. uh, could you talk a little bit more about what normally has to be done for LMIA? Yeah. So if the global time stream doesn't work, then the other route is the regular LMIA. With the regular LMIA, the idea behind it is that you're showing that you can't find a Canadian or permanent resident uh, in Canada for a particular position. And so that's why you're applying through the, the LMIA process. And so what that entails is actually advertising the role for a period of a month. Um, and then once that month of recruitment is completed, that's when you can actually submit the application to Service Canada for the LMIA. So it, with the regular route, you do have to do advertising. With the Global Talent Stream, there is no advertising requirement. And, you know, the LMIAs are supposed to be for uh, work that is uh, specialized or for certain work where you just, it's very difficult for the employer to find Canadians to do the job. Um, I would say recently, I, I don't know if you, you found this, Zia, 
it seems like the LMIAs are getting a little bit easier than before, uh, just because of the labor shortage, I think, in Canada. Some of the occupations um, tend to be, um, the officers seem to accept that mm -hmm. certain occupations are definitely in demand. Um, but that's certainly a discussion that you should have with a lawyer even before you decide whether or not you want to go the LMIA route. Uh, because, you know, it is a very tedious process. You do have to do all of that recruitment. And the recruitment is not just normal posting. It's very, very specific to the LMIA. Um, we find in general, 99% of employers, even if they've done advertising, it does not conform to the LMIA standards. And normally, if we're filing LMIA, we would have to, um, you know, redo the recruitment. Um, that being said, for certain specialized or certain occupations in demand, uh, if you need that worker, this might be the route to go. But uh, it's certainly not a decision to be decided on lightly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So we've talked a lot about the work permits and temporary residents. Now, what we wanted to focus on is permanent residents because you know, it, it's fine you, if you can, you know, have someone work with you temporarily, but if you really like that person and you really want them to stay with you on a long-term basis, the work permits are, you know, they're, they're short um, and they will end. So how is it that you can actually um, help um, them come and stay in Canada and get their permanent residency? Um, the first system that we wanted to talk with you guys about is the most popular system. It's called Express Entry. Uh, here's how it works. Uh, so in order to create ex uh, to um, apply through Express Entry, it's an online system. And first, the person would have to create an online profile. And they get to create it if they qualify under one of three categories. And we'll go through what these three categories are. Uh, but let's say they qualify they will be able to enter the express entry pool. Now, just because they've entered the express entry pool, it doesn't mean that they have applied for permanent residence yet. When they enter the pool, they're just a candidate. They're just shown, okay, I qualify and I'm interested. It's when they enter the express entry pool, they get a series of points that are based on their background and if they have provincial nomination. Um, and every two weeks or so, although uh, recently the government has had some um, lapses in, in time, but usually every two weeks or so, there is a draw where the government will invite certain people who are in the pool to apply with them. Um, usually it's based on what score that person will have. So they usually, for example, invite Let's say they, they're inviting 3,000 people. They're usually going to invite 3,000 people with the highest levels of the scores. But uh, sometimes they might choose other things. For example, um, sometimes they might only invite people who have provincial nominations. Sometimes they might invite people who only qualified under certain categories. And in the future, the government has said that they might want to invite people who um, uh, have uh, worked in occupations in demand. So, um, you know, so it's, it's not for sure, certainly, when someone enters the pool that they will be invited to apply. Uh, we can make educated guesses based on what was happening before and what the government announces. Um, but um, uh, it's certainly not something that uh, is for sure. Okay. All right. So let's dig a little bit deeper into these programs. Let's first talk about the three categories where someone can qualify. Um, the first category is called the federal skilled worker class. This um, is something for people who have never even been to Canada. They can apply. Uh, they can apply if they have um, worked while they're studying. Um, you know, this doesn't necessarily um, require someone to have worked in Canada, okay? Um, and this is one of the oldest programs, really. It, it predates 
the the express entry. Uh, my father, in fact, in the 80s actually applied under this program. Um, so it's it's something where they look at your work experience, they look at your language, and they, they calculate points and, and such, okay? The second one is called the Canadian Experience Class. Now, I'm going to really talk about this one because not only is this uh, Canadian Experience Class something that during COVID, the government was only selecting people in Canadian experience class. But this work experience for the Canadian experience class is very important because not only does it qualify them to enter the pool, it's this kind of work experience that will also give them points afterwards so that they can be invited to apply. Okay, so the work experience that is required for this is they need one year of high skilled work experience in Canada working for a Canadian, for an employer in Canada. And the uh, work has to be, when they are not full-time students, legal, and they have to be employed. They have to be an employee. They cannot be a contractor, okay? Not that they can't have a, you know, a contract. Of course, they have an employment contract or they, they can have an end date, but they have to be something where um, they have to get that T4, they should be on payroll, you should have deductions made from them, okay? Um, there's another one called skill trades. I'm not going to talk too much about it. Most people don't uh, qualify for this for people in the trades if they have LMIAs or provincial certification. Okay, so let's say someone is in the pool. Now, how do they get out of the pool? How many, how are the scores tabulated? I have to say, you know, I did this ranking system on myself and I, my points were really dismal. Um, and I would, um, you know, challenge a lot of people to think about their ideal immigrant, um, whether it's themselves or someone, you know, like Steve Jobs or Albert Einstein. And I will tell you that these people would probably never been be um, selected under the express entry system. So when people say, oh, it's so easy to immigrate, it's actually not. It's actually much harder now uh, based on certain you know, criteria to immigrate. So let, let me show you what it, I mean, okay? So the first uh, category is age. Now, when someone reaches their 30th birthday, every year it's their birthday, the points start dropping. So it's minus five points, minus six points in the 30s, minus 40 in their 40s, it's minus 10 points, minus 11 points. When they get to their 45th birthday, uh, the good news is they don't have to worry about age anymore, but the bad news is their age points is a big fat zero. And compared to someone in their 20s who have over 110 points, this is a very significant um, factor for someone. Okay, so if you have an employee who are in their 40s or even late 30s, um, and they say it's, you know, difficult because of their age, believe them. Um, this, you know, people say, well, this is age discrimination. Well, you know what? Immigration is all discrimination. <laughs> and it's allowed discrimination, unfortunately. Okay. Education. So uh, education is something where if someone has two degrees, then, and one of them has at least three years or more, then they, they jump. Otherwise, they also have a hard time with it. Language points. You know, I have people whose only language is English um, and, you know, they're, they're managers and they have master's degrees and they go and do these English exams called the IELTS or CELPIP. And oftentimes, they can't get the marks that we need for them. So what immigration wants right now in order to get selected is a very, very high level of language. It's mother tongue. Um, and it they test all four reading, writing, listening, and speaking. All right. Uh, relevant Canadian work experience. So this is the work experience that I was explaining earlier with the Canadian experience class. It's something where they have to be employed. They have to be an employee. Uh, they can't be a contractor. Um, so those pay stubs and the T4s uh, are very important as evidence to show that they have that Canadian work experience. Also, 
the work experience has to be high skilled. That's why those letters, we normally draft letters for employers to sign because, you know, a lot of most employers, they're, you know, you guys aren't immigration experts and you don't really know what is required, right? So it's much easier oftentimes for us to draft a letter for you guys to review the details, make sure they're accurate and then sign off on it. But the reason why these details are very important is because they have to sh provide evidence to the um, officers that the work that they've done conforms, that it's high skilled, uh, that it's full time, you know, that they've received a proper salary, et cetera, okay? Uh, foreign work experience is something that will give them points. Spouse um, it could add a little bit or take away a little bit um, depending on their spouse's background. Uh, provincial nominee programs that are express entry linked. So we've talked a lot about provincial nominee programs. Let me just give you a background for people who don't really understand what they are. Immigration is federal jurisdiction, okay? The federal government is responsible for administering uh, the, the Immigration and Refugee um, Protection Act. But the immigration, the federal government has made a um, agreement with every single province and territory to allow each province and territory to also have their own programs where they also get to select people that they want to get permanent residence. That's called the provincial nominee programs. Now, Ontario's provincial nominee program is actually quite large in the different kinds of categories that they have. They have express entry linked provincial nominee programs and non express entry linked provincial nominee programs. If someone is able to apply through a pro express entry linked provincial nominee program, then they will get 600 points if they are approved and receive a provincial nomination. And then basically they're assured that they will be able to receive an invitation to apply to apply for permanent residence under express entry. There are other programs that are not express entry linked. And so they wouldn't get the 600 points for this. Um, Zia will be speaking to you guys about what those programs entail. Uh, if they studied previously in Canada, they do get points like Sioux, uh, Sioux College. They will certainly get some points there. If they have arranged employment. So arranged employment is not available. These points are not available to someone who is on a post-grad work permit or other open work permits. It's only available to people who have LMIAs or who have other uh, employer-specific work permits and they've worked there for at least one year and they have a job offer for at least, uh, let's say one and a half to two years or permanent, okay? So oftentimes, you know, students, you know, the workers, they might ask their employers, hey, can you give me an LMI? It's probably because of these arranged employment points. Now, whether or not you should, that's a discussion, like we said, that you should have with your lawyer as to whether or not it's something that you're likely going to be able to get a positive labor market impact assessment for, okay? Uh, siblings will get some points. If, again, fluency of French, that really helps them um, to get those points. And trade certification, that's only for the trades of provincial certifications, okay? So looking at that, some of your employees might be in very good positions but a lot of people uh, won't. So what do we do if they fall into the latter category? Well, let me first talk about the express entry linked streams that will give them that 600 points that will basically assure that they will be able to qualify to get uh, their invitations to apply to get permanent residence through express entry, okay? So how Ontario uh, works, uh, is the best way for me to explain it is it's kind of akin to that dating app called Bumble. I don't know if any of you, I've never been on it. I live vicariously through my friends, okay? Uh, but they tell me what Bumble is, is uh, someone um, basically, the women, they uh, the men can't contact the women on this dating app. Uh, it's the women who can contact the men. So the men get into the pool, the women see the men and they decide whether to swipe right 
to accept them, I think, or swipe left to reject them, okay, and not, not deal with them, okay? So the OYMP system is kind of like Bumble, but for applicants. Uh, a person can't just apply directly to them, like, like the guys in Bumble, right? You can't just say, oh, I really want to apply, okay? No, no, no. First, you have to be in the express entry pool. And then Ontario will see who's in the pool and they will decide whether they want to swipe right on you, okay? And so who are they interested in swiping right on? Um, well, the first one is uh, called the human capital stream. They have indicated, so to qualify for so you have to have a bachelor's degree uh, anywhere. It doesn't have to be in Canada anywhere. Um, but they have indicated they like certain occupations, like occupations in tech. Um, and sometimes they, they select other op occupations as well. Um, so that's something that, you know, they, they don't tell us ahead of time how they're selecting. I think sometimes they may not even know that much ahead of time of who they want to select. Uh, tech draws is the only um, thing that they have announced that they actually do want to do on a regular basis. But they also, it's not just someone who has been in tech, they will automatically be selected. They also look at what someone's score is. So it's going to be a little bit lower than the normal express entry scores. How much lower? That remains to be seen, okay? Uh, skilled trades is something that we really like. Skilled trades is something where someone has one year of work experience in Ontario in one of the specified trades, they're the construction trades, okay, in the last two years. Um, oftentimes, Ontario will invite someone, even if their score is much lower than the normal draws, they will invite them to apply because they know that people in skilled trades, maybe their education is not as high or the English is not as high, but it's an occupation, these are occupations in demand, and they might invite them to apply, okay? And then French speakers as well, they also have an advantage. We also have seen a lot of occupation-based draws for French speaking in the last year, year or so as well. All right, over to you, Zia. Okay, so like Elizabeth said, she went through the streams for Ontario that are linked with Express Entry. There are also streams that Ontario has that have that are outside of Express Entry. So these are the non-Express Entry streams. Now in Ontario, there are three specific streams that fall under the employer-based categories. So these are programs where um, an applicant has a permanent full-time job offer, and they're basically applying for permanent residence, applying for nomination using that position. Right, so they're applying with the support of you, their employers, um, to apply for that nomination and then subsequently for permanent residence. Now, when we talk about the employer-based streams, there are requirements on the applicant, there's requirements on the job offer, but there are also requirements on the employer, so the company that's supporting their application through these particular programs. So let's first look at the employer requirements. Um, now, for the business, it does have to have been a business that's in operation for at least three years. You do have to have a presence in Ontario. Um, and for companies that are outside of the greater Toronto area, the gross income requirement is 500000 in your past fiscal year. And you currently have to have at least three full-time employees that are either Canadian citizens or permanent residents. So these are the main requirements for the employer. Okay, In terms of the position itself, it does have to be a full-time permanent position. When we talk about a permanent position, uh, what we mean is that there is no end date on their contract of employment. So you know, it, it's a basically of an indeterminate length. There's no, there's no end date for when that uh, position um, is going to end. Now, as the employer, of course, it's going to be very important to you to know what documents, what's going to be required on you if you're uh, supporting one of your employees through this program. The mandatory documents, so when the, when the employee is submitting their application to Ontario, the mandatory documents they do need to have is first an employer form, 
So this is a form that's um, provided by Ontario and has to be completed for each application that you're supporting through the employer-based streams. Um, form is not extensive in the sense of it's more of the basic information. It talks about the company, uh, looks at uh, you know when you were incorporated, how many employees you have. It goes through the position itself as well. So confirming again, um, the conditions of employment, like uh, what the position title is, when or what the salary is, any benefits. So basic information about the about the uh, company and about the employment position itself. Um, so again, not anything that requires any sort of extensive uh, work or any complicated um, answers in there. The second thing is an explanation letter. So this is very similar to what Elizabeth was talking about earlier. This is a support letter that's from the employer that the employee can use and, and is part of their uh, application to the province. So again, it goes through things like the position, when they started, what their hours of work are, um, basically confirming again that they do have this job offer. The job offer does qualify for um, the nomination program um, and that the company is supporting, which is, which is the huge part of this, uh, of the documents that are being provided to Ontario. The last thing, and again, this is standard for any sort of employment uh, relationship, is the contract of employment. So Ontario just wants to see, again, that there is that contract. That contract is in a permanent position, um, and it is a full-time role. These are the three main documents that have to be submitted by the applicant when they're submitting their Ontario application. Now, when we talk about their process of applying, um, what the applicant has to do for Ontario is that they create a profile, they go into a pool of applicants. From that pool of applicants, they have to be selected. And once they do receive that selection, it's called an, it's also called an invitation to apply by Ontario. Um, that's when they can apply and submit their actual application to the province. Now, when they're going through this, um, and they receive their ITA, they only have 14 days to actually submit their full application to Ontario. Um, and so you may get employees that are saying, we do need this, there is a bit of a time crunch, and that's because there's only a 14 day period from when they get their invitation to when they have to submit their application. Now, after their application is submitted to the province, Ontario could come back and ask for further documents from the company, from the employer, um, to confirm that the company meets the requirements for the employer-based streams. Generally, these documents can include things like a T4 summary. Um, it can include things like the um, T2 schedules 100 and 125. And this is really just to confirm that the company meets those minimum requirements, that gross income requirement that we talked about, uh, the requirement in terms of your current um, employees that are Canadian citizens or permanent residents. It doesn't happen in every application. There are many applications where Ontario will not request anything further. Um, you know, they look at the employer form and the, the support letter, and that's generally sufficient. But it is important to know that if requested, um, then those will be documents that, that Ontario generally asks for um, when they want them. Um, and, you know, we understand that a lot of times some of these kind of documents are and information may be sensitive um, and you probably don't want your employees to know. Um, these other documents are requested by the Ontario government and um, you can submit it directly to the Ontario government. Um, the first sort of documents, some of the document, like information on the form, like how much do you um, earn or do you have any employees, um, may be sensitive. Uh, you know, in those kind of cases, it's often important to have a, a lawyer who is bound by solicitor client privilege in, to be in the middle as a firewall because you know, you can say, well, you know, this is confidential. And so we do not want the employee to know. And the employees really don't want to, don't, they don't care about that. They just want their application to be submitted. So oftentimes, for example, when we act in this, these situations, we can act as the firewall where we will submit the application directly to the government without showing the employer form or the documents to the employee. 
Perfect. And then with these employer-based streams, like I mentioned earlier, there are three uh, streams that fall under these employer-based categories. Um, and those three are the, the first one is the international student stream. Um, here, in terms of the job offer requirements, it does have to be a high-skilled position and the salary has to meet entry level wage. Now, when we're talking about the entry wage or the median wage, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, this is based on the occupation, right? So looking at the specific job offer that the employee has and determining what that entry level wage is based on that particular position. The second stream is the skilled worker stream. Again, we're looking at high skilled jobs, uh, but here, the biggest difference is that it has to meet the median wage instead of the entry level wage. And the third stream that Ontario has for the employer base category is the in demand occupations. For this program, there are a list of occupations where Ontario will accept applications for so that fall under this program. Um, here, a lot of the job offers, a lot of the, or all the occupations actually are all low skilled positions. So this is where we see the, one of the only streams that, you know, we've talked about today that include low skilled positions, um, as part of their, uh, as part of the eligibility criteria. Um, and then in terms of the wage requirements, uh, it has to meet the median level wage. Um, overall, I just wanted to sort of say this kind of program um, you know, when people apply for permanent residence, they are looking for a way to stay in the country. And, it, you know, if they had other ways like, like express entry, normally I would just say, why, you know, go through express entry is much faster. This kind of program takes around uh, two years to get permanent residence. Now, um, on the part of the employer, uh, what I tell our clients who are employers is, you know, this is something that isn't too much of time um, and, and energy for, for someone to do. It's not an LMIA where they, you have to advertise and show you can't find a Canadian to do the job. Um, if they already have a work permit, there's no recruitment requirement of Canadians. Um, the other thing about this on the flip side is when someone applies under this program, they have to continue to work for the employer in that job until a decision is made on their PR. This entire process takes two years and it means that there is some forced loyalty on the part of the employee to continue to work for the employer. You know, so you, you kind of are assured that you're gonna keep them until you know, they get PR, which could be a while. That, that may be a good thing, uh, but let's say you know, in, in the end, they don't really work out. You are able to um, let them go just like other Canadians as well, okay? All right, so let's talk about the RNIP program. Now, um, the RNIP program is the Rural Northern Immigrant Pilot Program. It's something which the government has done where they focused uh, more on the communities. Um, the, the government really is going that direction where they really want to focus on um, allowing communities, provinces, uh, uh, cities, you know, to decide who it is that locally they want to get permanent residence. And so the government has this program, which is a very good program, uh, which allows certain select communities, and Sault Ste. Marie just happens to be one of those, uh, to participate. Um, and it's something where first we really need to get a recommendation from uh, Sault Ste. Marie. And, uh, you know, the criteria from Sault Ste. Marie, it's very uh, much they need to have a job offer from an employer in the community, okay? Um, so certainly um, if you want to hire someone and you want to offer them a permanent job, then this is something, and you're in Sault Ste. Marie, then this is certainly something that we can look look at because it provides, it gives you a leg up for someone to say, you know what, I really want to uh, stay in Canada. This is a good job and I can participate in this program. Well, I'd rather, you know, do that than go to Toronto where my, my chances of getting PR are a lot less, right? Um, so in order to qualify, some, they, 
the applicant themselves do have to uh, qualify. So either they have one year of qualifying work experience or they graduated from an eligible study program. So eligible study program in the community has to be two years or more at Sioux College. Uh, I mean, they can do master's or PhD, but other than that, it's two years. And uh, if not, they need to have one year of work experience that qualifies, okay? Um, they uh, also need to have that qualifying job. Of, this is more of the community requirements. And uh, they need to meet the language benchmark. I think all students, if they are able to go to Sioux College, should already have, be able to meet that language benchmark. So this is a really nice one. Um, if they work in Canada, they don't need to have any settlement funds. Otherwise, they need settlement funds. This is a really nice program. And uh, what it does is it allows them to get permanent residence. And if their work permits are about to expire, it also allows them to get a work permit as well. Uh, to work for you as well, okay? All right, so we've gone through a lot of programs. This is a lot of information. Uh, what we wanted to do right now is to just give you some practical pieces of advice on what you should think about when you're hiring international students. The first thing is, and we started talking about this right from the beginning today, it's you want to know what their status is. Right. So knowing what their what their authorization is in Canada um, and ensuring that that means that they can actually work for you. Um, it's also important to have your employees let you know when there's an update as to their status. So, you know, for international students who have applied for the work permit, um, basically making sure that they're providing you with an update as to when that work permit um, has been when they have a decision on that work permit application. Um, and, you know, when, when someone comes to work for you, those one or two years on their, or three years on the work permit, they can pass by very quickly. And if someone comes to you and let's say they're in the beginning of their three-year work permit, you think, oh, I can keep them for three years at least. Probably not, because if they're smart, they will want to look forward and say, well, I need to make sure that I can find the work and that qualifies me for permanent residence. So if you, the kind of work that you provide to them or the kind of applications that you're going to help them with helps them get permanent residence, then that likely would be an, an incentive for them to stay with you. But if you don't you say, you know what, forget about it, I don't care. You can, you have your work permit and I'm not, I'm not gonna help you, it doesn't matter to me. That kind of attitude often might prepare, uh, propel someone to say, you know what, I gotta find work somewhere else because PR is number one. PR is almost always the number one goal for someone when they uh, are coming to Canada um, and they finish their studies. Um, you know, it takes a lot of money, a lot of energy for someone to leave everything they know and come to a brand new country. And they have to be able to know that they can stay. Um, you know, I really love working with international students. They are some of the most hardworking. Um, they're, they're, you know, really smart people, um, really talented. And, uh, you know, they're, they're ambitious. They need to be able to stay in Canada. Um, so I, we find that employers who have that attitude where, you know what, they, they really have their employees back. And they say, you know what, we are going to help you with your permanent residence. Tell us what we can do and we can see if we can do it, we will help you. Those are the employers that create that loyalty with their employees that make their employees want to stay with them. And on that note, um, when they are going through the PR process, when they have initiated, when they are looking to submit their application and they're coming and asking for documentation, whether it's the support letter, an employer form, Whatever it may be, um, you know, it is important to be providing them with those documents on a timely manner so that they are able to submit their applications and, like Elizabeth said, uh, actually move towards their goal of, of getting their permanent residence. Um, and, you know, I, I like to suggest that it's important to set that tone from the very beginning. A lot of times people, 
they're afraid to ask, you know, oh, if I tell my employer, if they say no, or if I tell, ask them too early and, you know, uh, you know, they might fire me or something like that, you know, but I think if you are willing to help them and you tell them up front, it's very much appreciated. A lot of times people make assumptions that, oh, you know, what? I don't think my employer is going to help me. I probably should find my friend who can offer me this job. And it's unfortunate because maybe their employers are willing to help them and they just didn't have the guts to raise it with them, you know? So I think it's important to um, set that tone from the very beginning and say, you know what, we're here for you. We, we want you to stay with us permanently. Um, and, um, you know, we're willing to help you. All right, so um, this is our information. If you have any questions, feel free to let us know that um, you know you've come to this webinar, and uh, yeah, send us. I think emails probably work the best. Um, yeah, send us an email, and uh, we'll be happy to help you. Uh, okay, shall we go through some questions? Do we have any questions? We have no questions yet. Um, does anyone have any questions at all for us? You can enter it in the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. I think it's a lot of information at once. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we're that good. Maybe. That we answer all of your questions. <laughs> Okay, well, you know what? If we don't have any questions, um, thank you oh. so much. Oh, we have someone, okay. Okay, Elizabeth, for the co-op work permit, does the worker or student also need a sign off from the institution to have confirmation to work at the job they've applied for? Uh, I mean, Heather, what do, you, what do you guys do at the school? for co-op work permits? For a placement or a co-op, mm -hmm. we look yeah. to make sure they have the permit mm -hmm. uh, before we're sending them out to the employer. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case right now, it also means checking to see if they need the permit or if they meet the off-campus work allowance, which then potentially would exempt them. Um, so we just look to make sure that they have that in place, basically. Mm -hmm. Like from the immigration side, as long as the work permit just authorizes them to work. So you don't have to get anything else from the immigration side to have them work for you in that internship. Um, I think, um, you know, it's just a matter of um, the the school, I guess, confirming with you that it is a full program. Yeah. Um, and there was another question about whether or not you'll get a copy of the slides. Absolutely. Um, I do take... A little bit of time to edit um, these things, but I will prom I promise I will be sending these out to you guys. Oh, some more questions. Zia, um, someone wants to say that they can hire, a, so they can hire, they want to confirm, they can hire a student who's graduating with no work permit, as long as they are applying for one, they can work for 90 days. I think it was a so this is with regards to uh, an international student who's who's finished their program. Once they've received confirmation that they've completed their program of study, they can no longer work using their study permit. Once they have from there, once they apply for a work permit, assuming that they've applied within the 90 days and that they currently hold a study permit on the day of their um, work permit application, then they can begin working full time once that work permit is submitted and they can continue working basically until they have a decision on that uh, work permit application. So it's not that they can work for 90 days. They can work for as long as it takes to get that work permit issued. They just have to apply within 90 days uh, of when their program is uh, ending. Okay. Elizabeth, what happens if you realize that you don't have the required documentation or evidence and you realize they're not actually able to work because they don't have the correct permit? Okay. If you realize that they're not able to work, it's very important that you document that you realize and they do have to stop working right away. Um, I, I think that's, you know, yeah, just, you know, look at that. And you should probably seek the advice of an immigration lawyer as well. Um, and, you know, we can look at, for example, options for them to get back 
uh, their their status and be able to work, uh, you know, as soon as possible. Uh, can an international student with a work permit do a job that is not full time? Yep, they certainly can. I mean, the, the restrictions that we've talked about today is more so in terms of what their maximum ability to work is in Canada. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly it doesn't mean that it has to be a full-time position that, they, that they're working in. Okay. So, um, yep, yep, go, go ahead. ahead. Whose turn is it? I don't even... <laughs> oh, okay. So the next question here is for... Okay, so general practice here for, for one of the, the organizations is um, they hire students who are on work permits for co-ops, they work casually, typically they send us a copy of their work permit, and then we hire them full time when they graduate, they typically give us a letter from the government that they have applied and are waiting for their permit. They start working full time once they graduate with this letter, I just want to ensure we're doing this correctly. Right, so yes, that that is a good practice. So you know, once they've applied, they usually have a submission confirmation that they get from the government. And uh, yeah, they can start working. There's also that other letter that is that work from an extension letter where the government says, oh, you can work and then you can work until this date, right? So they can, with that letter, yes, it's good confirmation that they can start working, but don't just go by that date, okay? That date is not correct. Uh, if it goes beyond that date and they still haven't had their work permit, they're still entitled to work for you. Um, if it goes beyond that date, like, you know, if, if, you know, after three months, you, you can ask them, so what's happening with your work permit? And they say, well, I don't have it yet. You can ask them, well, can you send me a screenshot of your profile, which shows that you don't have a decision yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If uh they applied for the post grad work from can they work part time while waiting for their application to process for sure so again the 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 restrictions that we've talked about are the maximum hours right so a, someone who has applied for their post grad work permit is waiting for a decision can work up to full time hours but that doesn't mean that they can still also do part time instead that's completely fine um elizabeth so if someone has a study permit and they still have time left on their study permit in terms of the expiry date, they still have to stop working immediately after receiving confirmation of their completion of their studies, even if the, that study permit's not expired yet. Is that correct? That's right. So how the immigration law works is a person um, can only work if they uh, based on their study permit if they have uh, they are a full-time student as soon as they stop being a full-time student they just cannot work now there there is one exception that we didn't mention that i'm just thinking about now is if they finish the program but they're going to do another program and there's a semester in between and they've already been accepted to the second program so sometimes for example someone might do a one-year program in Sioux college um, and they finish in April, and then they're going to do another program in September, okay? In that situation, they've already been accepted to the new program in September, they finished in April, they can actually work that summer and they can work full-time. That's the only exception, okay? Otherwise, in general rule is once they finish their program, they're not going to do any more studies, then, uh, and they're no longer a full-time student, they have to stop working. Um, there's also one, <laughs> well, I think this, is, this is immigration law. There's also one other thing is the final semester, they can be a part-time student. Final semester, they can be a part-time student, they can still work, but otherwise um, they have to be um, a full-time student. If, if I can maybe help add some dates, because I think sometimes having a concrete example coming up sometimes makes it a little easier to wrap your mind around. Yes. Um, so for, say, students who are studying right now and they're graduating this April, the last day of class is April 21st. We will not be giving them proof of completion until May 12th. Um, and so between April 21st and May 12th, they're allowed to work with whatever their student status is. Normally, that's maximum 20 hours. 
with the current exceptions, there will be some who can work full time. But on May 12th, if that remains the date, we're going to confirm that for the students, but we'll use that as the date for this explanation. On May 12th, whether or not they log in to get it, we have issued them a note that says you've graduated. And at that point, they're not students anymore and they can't work using that student status. And so then they would need to apply for this permit. We try to push our students to be ready on May 12th to apply. So they can get that document on May 12th, they can quick submit, and they can be working again on the 13th, as long as they're ready to go. So just to give examples with exact dates, because I know sometimes that helps people, and that's the, the most current example I can think of. That's wonderful. I'm, and this is the thing about Sioux College. They are, the international department is fantastic. They really, really help the students out. You know, I, I do a lot of uh, these lectures for for different schools and colleges. A lot of times there's a huge lapse in between the notice by the school that they've completed and the transcripts and, and the completion letters that are issued to the students. So there is sometimes there's, you know, a week or so in between that time and then the students can't work. But the, the way that Sioux College has done it is really great so that you know, they only notify them when these documents are there. So they, they there technically doesn't even need to be a lapse. If they're ready to submit, then they submit it and then they are, they're good to go. Exactly. Yeah. We don't want to force students into a gap and we don't want employers who want to employ our students and graduates mm -hmm. to have to deal with someone who's working for them who can't work for two weeks. So we try, we only notify them they're done when they can get the documents they need to apply for this permit. Wonderful. Okay, uh, is it my turn or your turn? See, I forget. <laughs> uh, your turn to ask. Okay, if a student is here on a co-op specific work permit, are they able to work part-time in another field at the same time? So that co-op work permit is specific to their co-op position, but that doesn't change their um, the permission that they have to work using their study permit, right? So because while they're doing their co-op, they're still considered a full-time student, they can use their study permit to also be working um, up to the 20 hours a week, for example, uh, off campus somewhere else, doesn't matter what field or, or what position that's in. Okay. Okay. Wait, these questions are complicated, eh? <laughs> international students, the, the, the law that goes into international students is such a minefield. It's uh, there's a lot. Yeah. So the next one here, Elizabeth, so um, this is another uh, example. So they have successful candidates who do not have a work permit yet. We give them an offer of employment for work and they are now moving forward with getting their work permit while they're finishing school. So we would wait until they have the submission confirmation before they start. Yes. So Yes, exactly. So I think if, there's actually a second part to this. So we would allow for them to continue working beyond that date until a decision has been made and ask for a screenshot for the profile if they don't have a decision yet. Yes, you got it. So as soon as they show you that they filed that work permit, you can start working and then, you know, they can continue to work as long as the decision has not been made. Perfect. And then Elizabeth, with the RNIP, can the job be part-time? I don't believe that the community is interested in part-time work. They they want something to be full-time. Now, full-time is not necessarily 40 hours a week. 30 hours is considered full-time. Okay. Correct, but it does need to be full-time permanent. Yes, that's right. Uh, final question. Some of our students have both a study permit and a work permit. As long as they have the work permit, they can start working full-time April 22nd? Yeah, if they have a valid work permit, we're not talking about the co-op work permit, we're talking about a different work permit. Um, as long as they have that other work permit, then yes, they can be continue working full-time. So you gotta pay very close attention to that work permit. Examine that work permit very carefully, okay? It can't be that co-op work permit and say, oh, you can work in a program that's integral to your studies. Well, if the work that you're offering to them is not part of a co-op program that's not integral to their studies, that work permit does not allow them to have it. Now, right now, the government has issued that new program, which allows dependent children of work permit holders to also get an open work permit. That could be something that allows them to work, um, which is an open work permit. Um, so, or maybe they have a spousal work permit or, or some other kind of work permit. 
just because they will have a work permit doesn't mean that they can work. You have to look at the conditions of the work permit to see whether or not they are allowed to work. And this, this confuses students a lot too because the co-op work permit does not say at the top co-op work permit. It yes. just says work permit. And yes. so I would bet 95% of the time if our student says I have a study permit and a work permit, it's most likely a co-op work permit. But this is where that remark at the bottom that Elizabeth's been talking about comes into play, right? Because that on, on the co-op work permits, it'll say at the bottom in the remarks section that this is a work permit for um, position that is integral to your study. So it'll talk about the fact that this is specifically a co-op um, a co-op work permit, or indicate at least to employer yeah. services. Yeah, it, so it might not use the word co-op, but at yeah. least those types of warning will then indicate to employers that this is meant to be a co-op work permit. Yeah. That, or that, will that often list Sioux College. Easy. That would just be too easy college. if they called it a yeah. co-op work permit. It would make too permit. much sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's too easy. It often lists Sioux College as the employer as well. So it will list all their details and you can see under employer, it will either say DLI for designated learning institution, or it will say Sioux College as the employer. And that's a pretty big red flag for you as well. Sorry, I cut you off, Elizabeth. No, no, not at all. No, that's great. Um, and is co-op work permit only issued per semester? No, so it can be issued. It's generally uh, students will apply for it at the start of their program because they know that co-op will form a part of their program. And so it'll be for the same duration as their study permit, which is why so important to look at that remark section. Look at look at what we've been talking about. Okay, guys. Uh, well, I think that's it. And um, thank you so much for, for attending. Thank you so much for your great questions. Let us know if you guys have any future questions that we can help you guys with. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank, so thank much you all for joining. Thank you, Elizabeth and Zia. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.